Malachi, the third chapter. Throughout all of this book, the prophet has been taking words from God and accusing them, and they have been answering as though they were in total ignorance of what he was talking about. You see it in such lines as chapter 1 and verse 2. God says, I've loved you. And they say, wherein hast thou loved us? And on down in verse 6, ye priests have despised my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? You have this same theme. God makes an accusation and they say, we don't know anything about it. In chapter 2, verse 17, wherein have we wearied him? And then in verse 13 of chapter 3, God sums it all up and says, Your words, your words have been stout against me. Now, if you will look carefully at the whole of the prophecy, you will discover that they were religious words. They were going through all the form and ceremony. But God says, Your words have been stout against me. In chapter 1, they'd been bringing sacrifices, but they were bringing the lamb with the broken leg, the lamb with the one eye. They were bringing sacrifices that were not without spot and blemish. They were giving God gestures. And in chapter 2, God spoke to the priests for the way they had acted in making a merchandise of all of their priestly office. In the third chapter, God had told them in verse 8 that they had robbed God. And they said, wherein have we robbed thee? They had not given to God that which was his. Just because of the fact that the Lord doesn't press you like your other creditors, the old nature will always take advantage of that fact. And that's what's being taught here. They had taken advantage of the fact that God didn't press them. Now, God works in different ways with different people. I am reluctant to say that in some cases it may not be the exact tenth. For I have known too many people who have told me the blessing of keeping an account and giving a tenth to the Lord. And sometimes more. I have a great friend in the ministry. And I can remember the story he told me about a great spiritual experience in his life. He had finished the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was an engineer and had a very good position. And I went to preach in Schenectady, and in the course of my series of meetings, God spoke to his heart, and he determined that he wanted to go into the ministry. Now, by that time, he was married, they had a child, and it was no small thing for them to step out by faith and start to study for the ministry. So, he went on, and finished three years of seminary and was ordained. And he told me that when they arrived in Boston, the salary was very, very small, not enough to take care of their expenses, and that his wife went out to look for a job. And she began to look for a job as a secretary, and she went from place to place to place to place, and they did not have any success. They came to the place where their bank account was down to about $65. And in looking at the account one day, he said, look, you know, when we came here, we had just $650 and there's 65 left. You know, we've never given anything of it to the Lord. I wonder if, if what he wants us to do is to give the 10%. If we do, of course, it cleans out the balance and we have exactly nothing left in the bank. And he said, the Lord seemed to say in his heart, prove me now, saith the Lord. They wrote out a check for $65, and they made it out to the missionary causes of the church, and they sent that check in. They had no more than done this, a matter of minutes, when the telephone rang, and one of the places where she had left a job application called her up and said, Are you still free to do some work? We have some work that we think you may do. And she went in, and there was a very fine position available for her, at a considerable bigger amount than anything she had expected to get. And it came in almost immediately, and then within a day or two, somebody who had owed him some money for several years wrote and sent him a two or three hundred dollars and said, you remember way back in uh, university days, you let me have this, and I'm now in a position to pay for it. And it was a great spiritual experience to them. Now, above all, don't interpret this in dollars and cents. The interpretation is 
that they came to the place where they said, Lord, we want to do everything that thou dost want. Our hearts belong to thee. Money means nothing. We want our hearts to be yielded to thee. Then God is bound to prove his love. Open the windows of heaven and pour out the blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Out in the Dust Bowl in the Middle West, there are stories of fields in Christian homes where the rain fell upon their crops and they weren't hurt as bad as neighbors a hundred yards away. From now on, there's quite a different story that goes into the fourth chapter. You'd be interested in knowing that in the Hebrew Bible, there is no division of chapter four. They only have three chapters and they count chapter four as six verses going on still with the third. There is the change and God talks about the little few who did love him. There are those that are alive in Christ. There are those who are really joined to him. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in them. The power and life of God is manifest in them. And here it says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. I remind any who are here and who do not understand the meaning of the word fear, that when the Bible speaks of the fear of the Lord, it's never talking about the fright of the Lord. It is very, very unfortunate that the word fear has come to mean in English in the last 300 years what it was never meant to mean. For God is not talking about anyone being frightened of him, but those who have that godly reverence and awe toward him, the desire to please him. Oh, that we might not fear him. It's the same feeling that a bride has towards the bridegroom. She wants so much to please him that she might say, oh, I was afraid I had burned the potatoes. Afraid? Why? Was he going to beat you? Oh, no, of course not. Well, why did you say I was afraid? Well, I, I mean by that, I had a great love and a desire that everything should be perfect. And that's the fear of the Lord. And they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Now, when they speak one to another, this was spiritual fellowship. And it says, the Lord hearkened and heard it. Now remember that God is listening to your conversation. God knows every word of gossip that you've ever spoken. And it's all down on his recorder and it's going to be played back to you at the judgment seat of Christ. My, some of you people are going to have to listen to a lot of stuff someday and don't forget it. The Bible says you shall give an account of every idle word. And there can be no doubt about it. You are going to give an account of every idle word. For words are very important things in the sight of God. And you have no moral right and certainly no Christian right to spend time chit-chatting with each other. He said, she said, he said, did you hear, she said, they said, he said. Little people talk about people. Bigger people talk about things. But the greatest people talk about ideas. And you can rate yourself on that. If when you meet friends and talk, you talk about ideas. Do you? Because, believe me, you've got to face the fact that in the sight of the intelligentsia of this world, let alone in the sight of God, people that have no subject of conversation beyond the other people in their circles are in the sight of God little people. Take the word, talk about the things of the word. Well, someone says it's not nearly as interesting talking about what we have in justification as it is in talking about whether or not Miss So-and-so will really be able to make the grade and get engaged to Mr. So-and-so. But God says that you're going to give an account of every idle word. And whenever he finds Christians that are willing to talk about him, the Lord, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Remember that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And if your heart is abundantly filled with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will abundantly overflow about the Lord Jesus Christ. But if your heart is abundantly filled with little piddling office gossip, school gossip, church gossip, rumors, well, someone says it's, it's, it's not gossip, it's just that we're showing that we're interested in people. 
the old parsing of the verb, I am firm, you are stubborn, he is a pig-headed fool. Depending on whom you're talking about, exactly the same act, whether you speak of yourself or the person you're talking to or the third person. And so you may say, I am a warm-hearted, generous person, extrovert, interested in human personalities. And someone else overlooking says, yes, you are a dirty gossip. They that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written for him, before him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. What? Oh, yes, says God. Recording angel, put it down. What do you mean? Why, two members of 10th Church met each other, and they said, Oh, let's talk about that sermon. Didn't think we get something wonderful out of it. Well, what do you think this verse means? And they spent their time talking in terms such as that. God says, that pleases me. Put it down. Do you speak often one to another? Do you build up each other in the church? That's what you're supposed to do. That's the reason that every member is to edify one another, to think of the Lord, to speak of the Lord, to build each other in the Lord. And whenever it happens, the Lord is listening. The Lord is listening to your conversation. And God says, write it down, write it down, write it down. They're talking about me. Well, someone says, isn't that proud of God to want us to be thinking about him? Oh, no, because God is perfection. And perfection must always be glad when imperfection is interested in perfection. If God were imperfect, then he'd be proud to want people to think of him. But when he is perfect, then he knows that it's for our highest good that we think on him. There are people whose hearts are set on me and who want to know things about my life, my word, my spirit, the things to come. For them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name, that thought, oh yes, says Lord, look down in that great office, and they're all just going through their work and thinking about their weekends and their vacations and their houses and what they're going to do and their gardens and their dates, the maliciousness of gossip. But God said, look, there was a bookkeeper that got the last balance, and in their own heart they thought about me and said, Lord, I need thy strength, help me. God said, write it down, write it down. Somebody in Philadelphia thought about me. Right in the midst of that office where everybody was wondering how they could make a fast buck, somebody thought about me. Why think of it in that theological seminary? Why somebody stopped thinking about an argument and wondering how they could finagle something to get a call to a big church? Somebody thought about me and said, Lord, you can put me where you want to. Write it down, says the Lord. Write it down. I will never forget it. Somebody thought about me. Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. And Paul spoke of Timothy. I have no man with me who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things that are Christ's. But Timothy did not seek his own. He sought the things that were Christ's and he would naturally care for their state. It's the type of person that God says, write it down, put it down in the book. This one feared me and thought upon my name. Now, this is what the Lord wants. This is the way the Lord wants us to be thinking in his direction. And the Lord says, they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Now, somebody wrote a children's hymn about this. It's a nice little children's hymn. We used to sing it in our home. My own children have sung it many a night, gone to sleep singing, when he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels. All his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own, like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. And the second verse, little children, little children who love their Redeemer are the pure ones, are the bright ones, his loved and his own. But biblically, it's not true. It's old children, old men, old women, young men, young women of any age. They are his jewels, precious jewels, providing they talk about me, says the Lord, instead of their neighbors. Providing they're not merely interested in the gossip of the school or the hospital or the office. Providing that they're primarily not interested in those things, but turn their hearts toward me. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Now this making up of his jewels is a very interesting phenomenon. 
There's a great deal taught in the scripture about jewels. I had my attention called to it by a Christian businessman who was a jeweler who's now in heaven. George Beatty of Cleveland, Ohio, had a very wonderful jewelry store in Cleveland. I have seen in the window of his jewelry store magnificent peacock with its tail spread out, and there wasn't a thing that wasn't emeralds or rubies or diamonds or topaz, gorgeous stones. And here were these portraits in stones, these various things that he made and put in the window, and many thousands of people would stop by to look at those pictures which he made there. His was a very high-class work. And he showed me something that he was making at that time. And I never forgot it in connection with this text in that day when I make up my jewels. He had furnished for Mr. Alfred Sloan, the head of General Motors, a pendant. Mr. Sloan of General Motors had been very, very pleased with the trinket that he had bought his wife for Christmas. This caused him to write Mr. Beatty and say, Our dearest granddaughter is going to have a birthday soon. And we want something that would be distinctive and really of beauty. And we wonder if you could think up something. Now, our dearest granddaughter is 17 years of age and our dearest. And in the course of the letter, Mr. Beatty underlined and showed me that five times in the course of the letter, they had used the word dearest. So he said, this is what I am sending them. And there was a ring. And it had baguette stones, beautifully cut so that the light scintillated upon them. And the first stone was a diamond, and then there was an emerald, and then there was an amethyst, and then there was a ruby, and then there was a second emerald, and then there was a sapphire, and then there was a topaz. And I looked at it, and it was very beautiful, and I said, but why do you have two emeralds? And he smiled at me and said, don't you see? Well, he says, because there are two E's in dearest. If you spell the initials of those stones, that it makes out the word dearest. D for diamond, E for emerald, A for amethyst, R for ruby, E for emerald, S for sapphire, and T for topaz. And those seven little baguette stones lying there together made one beautiful ring and spelled the word dearest. He looked at me and you could just see the joy gleaming out of his face. He said, I, I prayed and asked the Lord to give me an idea. And he said, I, I noticed how many times dearest was here and I underlined it. I got this letter from him when I sent him the sketch. And Mr. Sloan was so pleased, thought the idea was wonderful. Now you turn over to Isaiah and you'll find that it says that we are as dear to him as the signet upon his hand. In the Orient, of course, in the olden days, almost nobody knew how to read. And every man had a ring that had on it his personal seal. And almost every man in the ancient world wore that ring with a personal seal. And every time a sale agreement was made, a document was signed, down went that seal into the wax. Or that seal was embedded in the fresh plaster of that which was to make up the cuneiform inscriptions in the clay tablets. And a man carried that ring because it was like the signature on his bank check. It was very precious to him, and the Lord said, So precious are you to me, as the ring upon my hand. That's what Wesley meant in that great hymn, Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. And thus we are in his sight, precious to him. Oh, I do not think that you can have any concept of how the Lord loves you. No matter how you might think towards him, to examine that love, to think on what he thinks about concerning you. There never was any young bride looking up at her bridegroom that loved in any wise as the Lord loves you. There was never any love in this world to be compared with that which the Lord loves you, just as you are. He saw me ruined in the fall and loved me, notwithstanding all. He saved me from my lost estate, his loving kindness. Oh, how great. Ah, they shall be mine, says the Lord, when I make up my jewels. I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. For I'm going to deal with them, says God, and I'm going to bring my people back. 
And after three chapters of telling the people that their words were stout against him, God speaks of the little remnant and says, Now these are the ones I'm going to deal. And you shall return. You'll come back. God says, I'm going to bring the nation back. For in the future, for this now goes into the realm of prophecy, the day shall come when the Lord Jesus Christ shall come and restore his kingdom upon this earth. And Israel shall be brought to know him. And then it is, says God, that in that day you shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Today you're not able to do it, but in that day you will. Between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. May God bless us in this study of the word and may we indeed speak often one to another of him and think upon his name. Try doing this on Wednesday and on Tuesday and on Monday and on Thursday. Try this sometime. Say something like this. Lord God, thou hast saved me and I am grateful and I do love thee. Try it. For God will indeed Pour out blessing upon you that's beyond anything you've known. If you say, Lord, I do love thee. I do love thee and I want to have thy power and thine holiness in my life. I want to go thy way. Lord, I do love thee. Say that to the Lord in the quietness of your own room. And see how God will answer you back and will let you know in ways that are peculiarly his own that he loves you and he will give you the exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. And then it says chapter 4, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now we know from the context, that which follows, that this is speaking of the close of the great tribulation. We do not know how long it will be before all the events of the second coming of Christ shall begin to take place. So we put a dotted line there, X, because he may come tonight and he may not come for years, decades, we do not know. So there's a period there we can count from the cross down through the centuries, but how long it will be till... The second coming of Christ begins, we do not know. The second coming of Christ is not an isolated incident, but a great series of incidents. Just as the first coming of Christ was 30 odd years long, so the second coming of Christ is seven plus 1,000 years long. Now in that seven year period, he begins it by taking out all of the believers today of the church age. And then immediately upon the earth, everything is reestablished. And God begins to work as he worked in the Old Testament and primarily through the Jews. The Jews are brought back into the land. And then, says God, there is going to be a day of great terror. It's called elsewhere the great and terrible day of the Lord. Another place it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 24 and said, Then shall there be great tribulation." So there is going to be that time of terrible tribulation upon the earth when the Antichrist shall come and shall seek to destroy the Jew because he knows from the Bible that the Jew is to replace him and that God is to give his power to Israel. Therefore he seeks to destroy this people entirely. And it shall be upon them as a day of great wrath and yet God will hold the little nucleus of his own people safe in the midst of all the horror of that tribulation. And so describing the judgment that shall come upon many, many of those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he then speaks to the spiritual remnant, those who will believe. For in that day, the Jews will be divided into two, called the many and the remnant, even as they are in the book of Acts chapter 15, the many and the remnant. The many are, well, like those who run the nation of Israel today. The remnant, those who believe in Jesus. And in the opening of the book of Revelation, we see that there are, at the outset of the seven-year period of the tribulation, after the Lord removes the church at the rapture, there are 144,000 Jews who are saved and who go forth as missionaries. By the miracle power of God, there will be 144,000 Jews 
All of them like St. Paul. All of them like Jonah after he got out of the whale. For in that day, the Bible says, a nation shall be born in a day. They shall look on him whom they have pierced. And there will be first of all 12,000 of each of the tribes, all with the fullness of the Holy Spirit, none of them having to learn a language, with all of the supernatural gifts. And they shall go forth into every part of the world. There will be no iron curtain that can detain them. But the gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness. For that group will preach the gospel to every person living under heaven. For the phrase, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness and then shall the end come, does not mean that the gospel of grace in our age must be preached to every creature before the second coming of Christ begins for us. But that after we are removed, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness and then shall the end of the great tribulation come. So here it is, the promise of the division between the many and the remnant. In chapter 4 and verse 1, he pronounces judgment upon the many. And then unto the remnant, in verse 2, he says, Unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Now there's a very interesting contrast here between this verse and a verse in the book of Revelation. For speaking to the Christian in the letters to the seven churches of Asia, talking about the little group of overcomers who trust in him, he says, to him that overcometh will I give the morning star. Now here he says, to you that believe I shall give the sun of righteousness. The night is far spent. We do not know which hour it is. We are not at the dawn. Now everyone knows the darkest hour is just before dawn. And perhaps we're entering into that darkest hour of the earth. And in the midst of the darkest hour, there comes the morning star. And that's the rapture of the believer. And the Lord Jesus tells us that to us in this church age, before his coming begins, that he will give to us in the midst of the darkest hour, the morning star, which comes before dawn. And then following that, the dark hour continues, the time of Jacob's trouble this burning day spoken of by Malachi, this great and terrible day of the Lord as it's described in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And then to the remnant of the Jews living in that time, he says, I'll give you the son of righteousness. For as in the dark hour we see the morning star, the rapture and are taken to be with the Lord, so the night finishes and the sun rises for Israel. So Jesus is called by the church title of the morning star and by the Jewish title of the son of righteousness who arises with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. Now, if you've ever seen the difference between a calf that's raised on grass in a field and one that's raised in a stall, well, I'll tell you, corn finished is what they call them. If you take a steer that grows up in the field and you kill it, kill a steer that grows up on grass, having run over the field, and if you look at a stake that comes from a steer that's raised out on the plains and has run wild, the meat is heavy, and it's not prime number one U.S. But if you take one that has been finished, to use what the cattlemen describe, a finished cow, is you take it off the field, you buy it, and you put it in the stall, and you feed it. You just put before it a mixture of corn and wheat and molasses and a few other things along with it, fish meal and other protein, and you give them this mixture, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. There's salt there so they can keep licking and be thirsty and drink and drink water and take more salt and eat more food and drink more, and they become like Jerusalem, who's waxed fat and kicking. Now, this is what the Bible describes it as. Now, this is the figure of speech that God uses of his people. He said, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. For there in the midst of all your trouble, while the Antichrist is there, the abomination of desolation, suddenly the Lord Jesus will come, and as he has done his work for the true church, so he shall do his work for the true Israel. And he shall rise as the son of righteousness, and you shall go forth and grow up like calves of the stall. 
how God is going to bless his people. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Who's going to win between the Arabs and the Jew? No doubt about it, the Jew. Don't misunderstand, the Arabs might rise tomorrow and kill every Jew in Palestine. That would not change the word of God. For God will put them back in his own time and God will do what he has promised to do and the day will come when like calves in a stall they shall be fattened and they shall put their feet upon the necks of the wicked and God is going to bless Israel. It is spoken and it shall come to pass. This is the course of history written in advance. And we can read it as well as we can read in Time magazine what happened last week so we can read in the Bible what is going to happen in the time of the future. The word of God shall stand. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then he speaks this way. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded with him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. He calls them back to righteousness. He calls them back to the covenant with himself. And then he finishes in this way, the last two verses in the Old Testament. And believe me, dear friends, after the Lord Jesus' second coming when he's removed us, these two words are as going to be as vivid and alive as John 3.16 is to you and me. For these two verses describe something that they're going to be looking for in a marvelous way. Behold, says God, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, after the Lord Jesus removes us, the true church, from the earth, God is going to send Elijah. Remember that Elijah never died. Elijah was carried to heaven in a chariot of fire, and God is reserving him for a certain purpose. Beyond any question, he is one of the two witnesses described in the book of Revelation. The two witnesses. I believe the other is Moses, though it's not pertinent to our subject here. These two witnesses shall come, and they shall preach as Elijah prayed for three and a half years, and the heavens were shut up. So it is that for three and a half years, half of the great tribulation, Elijah shall appear. I want you to notice the last two or three verses in the epistle of James. In James chapter 5 and verse 17, it says this, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's half of seven. Now in the great tribulation, the seven-year period, the Bible speaks of that period as a heptad, a week of years. It speaks of it, the half of it, as a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. It speaks of it in Revelation as 40 and two months, three and a half years. And it speaks of it again as 1,260 days, three and a half years into the Jewish lunar calendar. So God describes this period in the future in such a way that no man can ever call it a figure of speech. He describes this time in a period of a full seven years and in two halves. In time, two times, and half a time. He describes it in terms of months and he describes it in terms of days. It is to come to pass. The central figure on earth during this period will be Elijah and Moses come back. Now, if you understand this, you will understand why the disciples asked Jesus at the time of the transfiguration. Why, then, do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? Speaking, of course, of the last two verses of Malachi. And Jesus answered and said, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. So we find in the lips of Jesus Christ the authentication of this great prophecy made in Malachi that it shall be fulfilled for Israel. Elijah truly shall first come. In Chicago, or just north of Chicago, there was a man named Dowie who called himself Elijah Dowie. 
and said that he was Elijah. And he began to preach and a lot of people believed him and they established a little city north of Chicago called Zion City near the Illinois-Wisconsin border. But suddenly this Elijah died. And as soon as he died, why the movement rather petered out. How ridiculous are men in their blasphemy. But surely, says Jesus Christ in Matthew 17, 11, Elijah truly shall first come. Someone may remind me of a verse in Matthew 11. For in Matthew 11, there's another verse in which Jesus spoke of Elijah. He's talking about John the Baptist. And in Matthew 11, he says in verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That is, there were men that wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king, because he fed them loaves and fishes, and because they saw his mighty works. And if ye will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. They did not receive it. And so later on in Matthew 17, he says, I tell you truly, Elijah shall first come. When the Lord Jesus first came here upon the earth, he came to the Jews and said, I make you a bona fide offer of the kingdom. Will you receive me as your Messiah king and I will set up the kingdom? And they looked at him and said, what you're offering does not fit our blueprint of what we think the kingdom is to be. For the reason the Jews rejected Jesus was because of the fact that they had a specification and blueprint and they said the kingdom is when we the Jews who lie prostrate with the heel of the Roman Empire now on our necks. The kingdom is when God knocks down the Roman Empire, lifts us up and lets us put our feet on the necks of the empire. That's what we're waiting for. Are you ready to produce and make us top dogs? And Jesus said, no. The kingdom is not like that first. It's righteousness, it's peace, it's joy in the Holy Spirit. And so I am as the nobleman who goes into a far country to get the kingdom and to return. Oh, they said, crucify him. He's not offering us the world with a fence around it. And we want the world with a fence around it and nothing less. Thus it was that the Jews crucified Jesus because they failed to comprehend the nature of these prophecies. And yet when we take all of these verses, this one in Malachi, two in Matthew chapter 11 and chapter 17, the one in James which speaks of Elijah praying for three and a half years, and the one in the book of Revelation which speaks of the two witnesses, when we put them together we have a very clear mosaic. All of the pieces fit together like the pieces of a puzzle and form for us the picture that our God and Father has said this, when I am finished with the church in this church age, I will come in the rapture and I will remove the church and take the church to be with myself. Following this, I will send Elijah and Moses. For he said in Deuteronomy, I will send a prophet like unto you. And when I do this, says God, I will prepare my people. And here in the closing verses of the Old Testament, I will send to Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So when Jesus presented John the Baptist, he said, Now, if you would truly accept me, I would fulfill this prophecy, and I would count John the Baptist as being the fulfillment of Elijah come before me. But instead they refused Jesus. John had his head cut off. And later, Jesus said, Elijah truly shall first come. And the slow order of the centuries began to unfold. We know not the day, nor the hour, the times, nor the seasons, which the Father has put in his hand. But we may be absolutely sure that every word spoken by the Lord shall come to pass. And of this we may be absolutely certain. Since primarily these truths apply to an age which is yet future, and deal primarily with Israel as a nation, there is this conclusion for you and me. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And we see, therefore, the total fulfillment of all that he prophesied coming to pass. And if then the Holy Spirit was able to say at that time, the night is far spent, 
The day is at hand. How much more now? The night is far spent, and the day is at hand. And in the darkness of this hour, we thank God that you and I may look not for the tribulation terrors, but for the morning star, who is prophesied for us that the Lord Jesus shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and that the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we ever be with the Lord. So it is that I can bring to you this conclusion. If there's a man or woman here who has not been born again, I tell you, the day of grace draws to its close. The day shall come when you will confront God. Today is yet the day of grace in which the voice of God comes sweeping to you. God commands all men to repent. If you have never yet received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, bow before him. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then for you there is this conclusion. Our God is a God of love. How wonderful he is that he should have planned all this for us. And that as we see these dark days approaching, he says to us, look not at the darkness, keep your eye on the horizon. The morning star is about to come forth. There in the east, the morning star shall rise, and you shall have the morning star. And afterwards, indeed, after I take you out, there may be indeed the greatest darkness for the moment. But then I shall come as the son of righteousness for Israel. And all my purposes shall be fulfilled. May we live in the light of these truths. Let us bow in prayer. O oh God our Father, we thank thee for thy great faithfulness. For this book. So wonderful. So supernatural. So evidently beyond man's capacity for writing. Here, Lord, our God is revelation divine unfolding and revealing. Here is the fulfillment of thy great promise. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. O oh Lord God, in spite of our hearts and all their need, look upon us in Jesus Christ and take this word to each heart, convicting, comforting, using, building, strengthening, as thou seest our need. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.